This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. And today on the download, we have some interesting news out of the stock markets. Um, Unfortunately, kind of everyone is probably realizing now that everything has been taking a tumble, the word bear market getting thrown around, and uh, it can be a little bit of a tenuous time to invest right now. But with that said, we're going to try to bring you some, uh, you know, some interesting points and some things that you may not necessarily be aware of out there and also some very big news points. The biggest one right now, and unfortunately with uh, sliding stock prices and things, it has to do with ethics. We would all like to think that accounting firms and financial advisors and anyone really involved with your money would take ethics uh, pretty seriously. And unfortunately, that's not the case. The accounting giant Ernst & Young has been hit with a record $100 million fine for, and this is a big one, their personnel cheating on the ethics portion of the CPA exam. So this is not some type of uh, internal regulation for them. This is the actual Certified Public Accountant National Exam and Licensing Board. The accountants at Ernst & Young were, have been found to have been cheating on this portion of the exam, which is absolutely astonishing. Uh, it's one of those things where you, you hope that these large accounting firms, and this is an accounting firm that does financial audits and Sarbanes-Oxley compliance and things like that for Fortune 500 companies, companies that are listed on the S&P 500, companies that are on the NASDAQ, blue chip companies. This is an absolutely massive accounting firm. And for such a widespread and huge widespread issue and huge fine to be levied definitely causes a little bit of pause. It should for a lot of investors that are looking at at companies to invest in right now, if you are in that kind of arena, uh, to see if they were having their books done and audited and accounting reports done by Ernst & Young. Uh, Who's to say what necessarily this will actually affect in the marketplace, you know, you could certainly be said that, hey, you know, maybe they cheated on this portion of the exam, but their work is fine. Well, sure. But if they're willing to cheat on a certification exam on, especially on the ethics portion of it, I mean, that's just kind of a, a, a little bit of a double whammy right there for uh, something that you definitely don't want to see, especially for a company that has their fingers in so many different uh, companies out there with regards to their their accounting. So definitely a big one, Ernst & Young, $100 million for uh, personnel and accountants cheating on the CPA ethics exam. Tesla stock is trading a little bit lower ahead of their quarterly earnings reports. Uh, there's several things that have uh, kind of factored into this. They did just go through a large stock split. Uh, we have the ever charismatic leader of Tesla, uh, Elon Musk. You know, you can always, uh, with one tweet, uh, can definitely change the uh, way that markets are are shifting in many different directions. But this is more centered on uh, supply chain issues and production issues, especially out of their Southeast Asia market, where we saw them have to suspend or greatly reduce production in their large Beijing Gigafactory several times throughout this year uh, due to COVID-19 related issues happening in that part of the world. So while they are still seeing pretty solid growth numbers, the total amount for their projections is most likely going to be missed with the upcoming uh, quarterly report. So definitely something to keep an eye on. Also, they are seeing significant encroachment with the with their rival Rivian, uh, Rivian being the first to market with an all electric pickup truck. We have been waiting for several years for any sign that the Tesla Cybertruck is going to be hitting the market. And really, uh, mum has been the word on anything coming out regarding the Cybertruck. So the uh, first to market with rival Rivian definitely is going to be something that is needing to be watched over the next few quarters and maybe into next year, as we still don't really have any inclination as to the marketability or the viability of the production of the Tesla Cybertruck. So while they are very well established in in the uh, car realm with their, uh, with their, let's say, I believe it's the Model S, the Model Y cars, and then the Model X SUV. They don't have anything in the larger segment for pickup trucks or more of a utility vehicle. So being beaten to market by a rival, uh, and granted that their, you know, the rival is not perfect. Rivian has had some issues with quality control and other things with their product, but there's something to be said to being first to market. And this is definitely playing into a little bit of the uh, tenuous attitude that investors are having right now on Tesla stock.
We have some surprising news coming out as not, not ooh, I can't speak today as Nike stock takes a precipitous dive amid solid revenue and good profits. Uh, typically, people would think that you know when you're looking at a company, are they making profits? Are they hitting their their goals that they've set out for themselves when they have their uh, earnings reports? Well, Nike's kind of checked all those boxes. However, their gross margins and their costs have risen significantly to the point where that these increased margin or the decreasing of the actual margin that they're operating on is causing a lot of financial analysts to downgrade their stock outlook for the foreseeable future for Nike. So although they're making money and they're making profits exactly the rate that they're looking to be, other factors can definitely uh, help to adjust what their their share prices is trading at. And it's one of those things that I like to make sure people understand, especially if you're new to investing or you're just looking to get maybe a little bit of additional information or alternative outlook on things, is that share price is not always just going to be based on things such as profit and losses. There can be other things, you know, a company, just as example with Nike, can certainly have great earnings, profitability. But if the other extenuating circumstances, especially their margins, are getting to the point where the analysts and the market makers don't like it, then that can all be well and good, but the share price can still tumble. So we'll be interesting to see how Nike comes through the last quarters of the year, always seen as their strongest uh, part of the year is the second half. So while they are taking a dump now, maybe it's a good time to pick some of it up, especially with markets. And some analysts are, are a little bit on either side of the aisle as to how much farther the markets have to slip. Granted, we are actually in a bear market right now. So seeing where these things actually go and if we'll see an upswing with the increase in retail sales in the third and fourth quarters of this year, hard to say, but it definitely would be something to look at. And maybe a small play right there could help to make some people some money. In larger in larger financial news, we have the Fed Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell reporting that additional rate hikes are coming, not, not how much or something. He said that they are going to be coming. The Fed is going to be meeting in mid-July, and he indicated that there will be additional rate hikes. Now, this is something that you know certainly needed to have happened in some regards to help to try to curtail the large amounts of inflation that everyone is seeing. It's not just simply in housing markets. It's across the board. The CPI index or the consumer pricing index being up almost 20% from where it was last year and in some markets over, over double that. So people are definitely feeling the pain of the increase of costing, the increase of increased costs of goods and services without a commensurate rise in in uh, compensation and earnings. So hopefully this will help to curtail that to help alleviate some of the burden on the U.S. consumer. Because right now it is very tight out there for a large number of people. People are really struggling with a lot of different things and the increased cost of everything from your oatmeal in the morning to the gas that it takes to get to the supermarket to uh, the cost of meat and poultry shortages and things like uh, baby formula. These are all very greatly affecting people. And anything that monetary policy can do to ease that hopefully will be a good thing. However, it is going to make some things more expensive in an effort to drive down the cost of other things. So with that said, the last rate hike uh, brings the total up to 1.5% uh, since March. And the July meeting is expected to raise the actual uh, interest rate uh, between 50 to 75 basis points. Again, it's going to be interesting to see where this goes, but at least we have some fair warning on this. So mid-July, investors have about a solid 30 days from the recording of this podcast on 628 to kind of get ready, maybe shore up a few things, identify a few opportunities that may be beneficial to slightly higher interest rates, especially for those people investing in alternative assets, maybe positioning yourself more to cash to be able to be off, be able to offer uh, money to investors at a more advantageous rate or take advantage of the fact that because interest rates on the institutional side are, are increasing, you might be able to get a little bit more for your money if you are on the lending side of things as well. So just because maybe you're an alternative investor doesn't mean that you can't see some benefit from the increase in the amount of money in the institutional sector because so many people that maybe were just going for the quote free money from institutional lenders, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Truist, things like that, are going to be more apt to look at an alternative method to financing things like real estate purchases and other projects if they have more favorable terms, longer term, shorter terms, just more flexible options when it comes to the private market 
definitely an opportunity to be seen there. So just because one door is shutting doesn't mean you can't be the one to open up the other door for some of these investors. However, with the rate increases since March, a whole 1.5 full percent, uh, Zillow is still reporting that <clears throat> Uh, 11 percent uh, home prices have risen 11 percent from april to may uh, we'll see what the numbers say when june ends up here in a few days but it, i would imagine a little bit less but just at least tangentially from where we're located in florida things are still as hot as ever a house just two doors down from me sold for almost thirty thousand dollars over asking uh and, and closed immediately so it's still very very hot out there for a lot of markets the rate increases Granted, are going to be a little bit of a lagging indicator because home sale data is always going to be something that's about 30 days out because people get stuff under contract or locked into old rates. So it takes a while for this stuff to actually show when it comes to the purchases and sales of real estate. Again, something to wait and see. We'll see how it actually plays out. And with the last bit of news to kind of move away from real estate, the crypto exchange giant FTX has been very, let's say not forthcoming on their intentions of possibly merging with brokerage giant Robinhood. Robinhood, of course, having a whole bunch of issues with liquidity last year when it came to the meme stock trading of AMC and GameStop and things like that from the Wall Street Bets Reddit. Now, it's going to be really interesting to see if something as embattled as a crypto exchange, which again, cryptocurrency, nothing has really changed. It is still a bloodbath with cryptocurrency markets right now across the board. So many different issues that we should probably dedicate another podcast simply to just talking about what the new issues that are cropping up and the new uh, avenues that people are seeing uh, created for potential issues in those markets. But you know, with a crypto exchange being rumored to be buying a a broker dealer it will be interesting thing interesting to see how those two things mesh up again ceos on both sides saying that nothing is happening but especially in these kind of markets it would definitely not be surprising if a few months down the road that there had been back channel talks and this was just all a little bit of smoke to make people uh, kind of forget about it and actually something is coming in the pipeline for for the two of these ftx and robin hood to become one company in the near future this has been the down Today on the what is, what are basis points? I had mentioned that the Fed is raising their interest rates, and typically that is being reported as basis points. But a lot of people get confused with what an interest rate is. So talking about 1% and the Fed talking about raising something 50 to 75 basis points, well, no. Home, you know, bank lending rates and mortgage rates are not going to go up to 75%. So what exactly is a basis point? Basis points refer to a common unit of measure for interest rates and other percentages in finance. One basis point is equal to one one hundredth of 1% or 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. And as you should denote the percentage, <clears throat> or sorry, it is uh, or 0.01% or as a decimal, 0 0.0001. And is used to denote the percentage of change in a financial instrument. The relationship between percentage changes and basis points can be summarized as follows. A 1% change equals 100 basis points. And a 0.01% change is one basis point. Basis points are typically expressed by the abbreviation BP, BPS, or BIPS. This is, these are basis points, and this has been the what is. On the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast, we're going to be taking a little bit of a deep dive on health savings accounts or HSAs. We don't have a guest today, but this is something I feel that really needs a good deep dive because people so often uh, misunderstand what a health savings account is and just how incredibly beneficial they can be to you as the investor for not only offering you an additional way to invest, especially with the alternatives that can be done with these types of an account, but also just how incredibly powerful they are for compounding wealth within an account that is designed specifically for reimbursement of medical expenses. <clears throat> There's many different types of things out there that people might misconstrue with HSAs, and we'll get into those in a minute. But it's something that I, I kind of feel very passionately about. I really am a big 
a believer that the more informed anyone can be about any decision in life, the better off people are going to be just on a level basis. Obviously, everyone is individual with everything that everyone goes through, but the more informed someone can be, the more informed decision can be made. And ultimately, all else remaining equal, the better off that person will be typically with almost anything in life. And that's especially true when it comes to finances. And it is exponentially more true when it comes to making decisions regarding your or your family's health care. Health care being, of course, the, the, I guess a good way to put it would be relatively a contentious topic in the United States and good reasons across the board for that. Of course, we're not going to get into any type of opinion making or anything like that today. But what we'd like to try to do is give you good information on just how useful these types of accounts are and just you know the alternative ways in which they can be used. This is not something simply that you can set and forget. People don't realize that you have the power to really invest these things. You know, a lot of times when I talk about IRAs and different avenues of what I do for Advanta or in general with talking to clients and investors, people understand for the most part that you can take an IRA and invest it how you see fit. A lot of people buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds. I'm a big proponent of buying alternative assets, things like real estate, mortgage notes, private securities, limited partnerships, LLCs, precious metals, all of those kind of things to help offer maybe an additional edge to your whole portfolio diversification. But I would say from there, a very small minority of people with IRAs, 401ks and the like, think that you can only just add money into it and it basically just sits as a cash account. It's pretty well understood that most people think or most people understand that you can invest those types of accounts. Now, the big issue I run into a lot is people just don't realize how many options are out there, but rarely do I ever run into someone that said, oh, I didn't realize I could actually invest the money in this type of an account. Now, the paradoxical, the paradoxical shift comes with health savings accounts. I would say that probably 85 to 90% of people that have health savings accounts don't realize that you can invest them at all. Most of the time, people will have a health care plan. They'll choose the high deductible option with a health savings account, and they'll just put money into a checking account getting zero interest or maybe one basis point, so 0.01% on their money, and just assume that it just compounds money. They just you know, save money in that account for paying medical expenses, which couldn't be farther from the truth. And to that point, a lot of people don't even understand really what an HSA account is because there's so many different other options out there. So I'd like to kind of dig in a little bit of the history on these things, because if nothing else is important to understand, you know, kind of how we got to the place that we are, at least with these types of accounts. And I'm a bit of a history buff. I do enjoy the uh, the backstory to things. I think it's always interesting to know where stuff comes from, whether or not that that's useful information for people. Maybe not necessarily the most useful, but again, I find it interesting and I'd like to bring you interesting content. Um, so that way, you know, hopefully you get the Jeopardy question right. So what is an HSA? A health savings account is a tax advantage savings account for individuals with high deductible health care plans. And for the rest of this, I'm going to be calling high deductible health care plans HDHP. So if you hear me say HDHP, I'm referring to the health care plan. So a high deductible health care plan or HDHP that can be used for a wide variety of future medical expenses and not only just medical expenses. These accounts, once you get to a certain age, you can treat them as a retirement account. So if you've been healthy and let's say you get to the, the age where you're going to be on Medicare and, and you don't want to have and you don't really have the use for reimbursing yourself for medical expenses, treat it as a traditional IRA. So basically, you've just created another avenue for you to have an even more robust retirement with these types of plans. It's really cool, and we'll get into it in a minute. But let's dig into the history. Again, I always find it really interesting to know where these kind of things come from, because retirement accounts and everything, they don't just come out of a vacuum. We have everything people before 1974 didn't have IRAs or 401ks. It took legislation in the form of the Employment Retirement Income Securities Act, ERISA, of 1974 to actually bring about 401ks and IRAs. So understanding where this stuff comes from is interesting. So that way, maybe when future legislation comes up or you are looking for what representatives to vote for, you can kind of understand maybe some of their stance or what type of potential issues may have already been have occurred in the past and maybe understand some issues or benefits to some legislation that they're proposing. So not to digress too much, but the history of HSA accounts. Let's go all the way back to 1984 
when it was big hair, bright clothes, glam rock, but a very lack of the ability of the average U.S. taxpayer to really save for medical expenses. And the late 70s, early 80s is when we see a, a very large upswing in the actual costs of healthcare in the United States. Granted, healthcare has been an issue in the United States since people have been in the United States. It's always kind of been an ongoing issue, but at least the cost of healthcare really starts to rise about uh, 40 to 45 years ago. And it certainly has really done, gone nowhere but up since then. But back in 1984, the think tank, the National Center, the National Center for Policy Analysis or the NCPA, NCPA published a report about the need for medical IRAs. So people at this point have been using IRAs for about 10 years and, and really liked them. These types of accounts were taking off and people wanted an option for the use of some type of tax advantage savings account to help solve the long-term problems uh, that were facing Medicare and also the rising healthcare costs. Now, we really don't have much um, for the next eight years until we get to 1992. So we have some bills being put out that are going through Congress that are taking a stab at creating some type of medical savings account. Now, we really don't have anything until about the middle of the Clinton administration in 1996, when the Archer MSA plan introduced was introduced, uh, but contribution limits to these early plans by were made by employers and were subject to payroll and income tax to employees, and monies couldn't be rolled over year to year. Um, adjustments being made uh, were hopefully being made to make the plans tax free. So you kind of have the first stab at it, but people were seeing double taxation. Uh, kind of a use or lose scenario with the monies in there. So granted, it was a good kind of first try, but it really wasn't that refined. So Archer MSAs uh, continue on for about the next eight years. <laughs> it's kind of weird that we have eight year jumps in these things. Uh, so 2002, the Treasury Department created rules that health reimbursement accounts and this is one that I want people to kind of pay attention to is that HRAs are not HSAs. They're very different, but the Treasury Department rules that HRA or health reimbursement account contributions can be rolled over year to year. But if you are participating in a health plan that does offer an HSA, an HRA, if you leave that employer, the unused funds are lost. So granted, they do make an allowance for HRAs to be rolled over year to year for you to compound those types of plans. But if you leave your employer, all the money that had been saved up was lost, which really kind of stinked. It gave people less flexibility in their employment. Let's say you move, you had you know been diligent about your healthcare choices, and you had, let's say, $10,000 saved up in this HRA. Well, if that was employer contributions, you know, you lost that, which, which, you know, was really a big sting to a lot of people to say, hey, I've been responsible. I've used this type of savings account. I've made informed healthcare decisions, but yet I lose out on all this money that had potentially, quote, been saved for me by changing employers, which was really a big impetus for the 2003 legislative session for HSAs to be created. So for about the past 19 years now, we've had health savings accounts in the marketplace and watch them grow, watch people utilize them in different and more interesting ways, and really be a fantastic benefit to people by offering the tax advantage of a deductible contribution to a plan, having a lower plan deductible because these are high deductible healthcare plans, and allowing people to take more control over their healthcare choices because in these types of plans, you're going to be paying out of pocket. So you're going to be making a little bit more of an informed decision about what you know, procedures and things you actually want to have done. Granted, if you are someone that has a lot of chronic health issues or needs a lot of constant medical care, maybe not the best plan for you. But for those of us that are relatively healthy, don't have any chronic conditions, and would like something that's a little bit more affordable while also offering us the alternative to save for an additional but additional potential uh, retirement Avenue, HSAs are a fantastic option for that. So HSAs are created in 2003 and allow for the portability from job to job, which is awesome. So if you have a employer-sponsored healthcare plan and you select the HDHP option that has a qualifying HSA, then you could potentially contribute into that plan. Your employer could contribute into that plan. But unlike with health reimbursement accounts or flex spending accounts, the employer, when they make the contribution to that plan, no longer has any right to that money. It is all yours. So if they make the contribution to that plan and two months later down the road, you leave, you take all that money with you, which is awesome. It's putting more power in the hands of the individual taxpayer, the individual person to save 
create value and make informed healthcare decisions as well, while not having to worry about simply being tied to a job that maybe they don't like, maybe it's not working for them, maybe there's a myriad of other issues with their job, but they stay only because they had a large amount of money saved up in some type of flex spending account that they would lose if they left. This gives a lot more flexibility, and I and I really do feel a lot more rights to the individual employee by being able to use an HSA because HSA plans are not inherently that much cheaper or have much higher deductible limits than um, flex flex spending account flex spending account plans or health reimbursement plans. Now that has changed a little bit. Um, just from my personal experience, I have seen those deductibles uh, go down a little bit in the total out of pocket for the flex spending account and the HRA type plan. So the cost disparity between the two has increased a bit, at least in the past few years. So what are some of the other savings plans that I mentioned? I mentioned the Archer MSA and flex spending accounts, and I really wanted to find these so that people understand the inherent difference between these two and HSAs. Because when someone says they have an HSA, or I talk to someone about it, or they want more information, I always need to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Because at the end of the day, all of these things are, quote, health savings accounts. You use them to save for healthcare expenses, but not all of them are health savings accounts. I know it can be a bit confusing, but it's important to understand that if you want to utilize one of these plans or you need some more information on something, or you just want to understand what options are out there to you, is to understand what actually are your options. So the Archer MSA, again, for anyone that is 20 or older, or between the ages of 20 to 50, you probably have not even heard or used one of these accounts. For older people, um, maybe 45 to 70, yeah, maybe you have an MSA. But again, important to understand what they are. Uh, it was created in 1996, named for Bill Archer, one of the early proponents and forerunners to HSAs, was putting out a lot of great legislation for that. These expired in 2005, but if you still have an Archer MSA plan, you can still use the funds, but you just can't contribute. Contributions on these types of plans were made by the employer or the employee, but not both. They were limited to self-employed and small businesses, and contributions were based on percentage of annual deductible. So rather complicated, not super flexible. The Archer MSA, again, more of just a history lesson. If it pops up on Jeopardy, I hope you get the question right. Now, flex spending accounts are something that is still in effect. Um, they can also be referred to as HRAs or health reimbursement accounts. Now, what these plans are, they cover expenses not paid by insurance, including deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. Under the Affordable Care Act, you can carry over up to $500 from year to year. They offer employees alongside traditional health care plans, and the maximum contribution limit for 2022 is $2,850 into one of these plans with your ability to roll over $500 per year. So potentially your balance at the beginning of any given year could be about $3,300 into one of these types of plans. The downside to this is that they are not portable from job to job. So if you leave your job, you lose all the money that's in that flex spending account. Again, flex spending is a type of savings account for medical use, but it is not a health savings account. Important to understand. So just because you have maybe a debit card with your healthcare plan doesn't necessarily mean that is a HSA. We really need to make sure that we look at look at it and determine, hey, is this actually an HSA or not? Because that can determine a lot of your options. Because especially with an FSA, you don't have any say over how those funds are invested. And typically they're not. They're just going to be in some type of money market. You're going to get 0% interest in it. Now with an HSA, you have the ability and the um, and the direction to invest those funds. I have clients that have bought rental properties with their with their health savings account. So they've set up themselves and potentially their families to have rental income going into an account that is completely tax exempt. And if they want to take reimbursements down the road for medical expenses, they can use that rental income coming into their health savings account. Again, the health savings account actually owns the piece of real estate. So the ability to invest in not only you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds is there, but you can also invest in alternative assets with these accounts as well, which I think is just amazingly cool. I hope it kind of comes through in how I talk about these things that I think it's very awesome that people have the ability to take something as maybe as mundane as they would think about a health savings account and invest in real estate, um, make notes in mortgages, invest in a real estate syndication if you want to, uh, have the ability to do a lot of these really interesting things that you know, I would say that, again, probably 85% of the people out there don't realize you can do with these things. 
Now, what are some benefits to HSA accounts? Really what the impetus for this is, is the government's encouraging better healthcare spending habits. The thought is, is that if you spend your own money, you'll do more research into what you are purchasing and make better decisions. Theoretically, again, <clears throat> theoretically, this would ultimately lower healthcare costs. Now, I would say due to a lot of different factors, of course, the HSA has not uh, single-handedly won the war on high healthcare costs, but it allows people to make more informed decisions and also you know, be able to say, okay, well, if my insurance is not going to cover this, I have an additional avenue for tax advantage savings and contributions to pay for a procedure or something that maybe isn't directly covered by my insurer, but is still incurred while I have my high deductible health care plan. So I can use these funds to reimburse myself and pay no taxes on that distribution, even if I have considerable earnings for the contributions that have gone into that plan. So again, additional flexibility to where you have another bucket of money if you need something done or want something done that is a qualifying medical expense to reimburse yourself if insurance, you know, if you're still paying out of pocket and have a method deductible for the high deductible healthcare plan, or you just would like to do it, and it is a qualifying medical expense, you have that additional freedom to do it. So there's special savings accounts just for health expenses. They are supplemental to health insurance coverage. They are not in lieu of, but they are a supplement to it. You get to retain these types of accounts, even if you switch employers. So you're no longer beholden to an employer for that additional amount of money held within a flex spending account or an HRA. Contributions are tax deductible, which is awesome. And even better, you get tax-free growth on investments. If you take a distribution uh, from one of these for a reimbursement of a medical expense, you get to treat it like a Roth IRA and pay zero tax on it. So you can get a deduction for the money going in. All the money you earn is completely tax-free. And then potentially you have the ability to create another tax-free distribution route for you with reimbursement for medical expenses, which I think is just one of the coolest deals that the IRS gives you with regard to saving for your future, is that specific ability is to have it be able to be distributed tax-free for reimbursement of medical expenses. And hey, let's say you don't have many medical expenses. You were just the epitome of health. You worked out, you drank your green smoothie, and you were all set. You get to the point where you have, let's say you have Medicare and now you can treat it at 65 like a traditional IRA. So all those years of savings, tax benefits that you got, you can now treat it like an additional retirement account once you get to be a certain age, which is a huge benefit that I think more people need to realize. And obviously everyone would love to aim to be healthy, but if you can be healthy and avoid healthcare costs or at least make more informed healthcare decisions, you could potentially have another block of money that you've had tax advantage growth on for retirement. And HSAs supplement HDHPs and allow for payment of non-covered healthcare expenses with tax deductible money. So what are some example benefits of an HSA? So let's say you contribute uh, $36,500 to an individual HSA plan, which is the current 2022 limit. You get a tax deduction on your income tax return. At a 20% tax, tax bracket, the tax savings is going to be $720. You can now distribute up to $3,600 $3,650 tax-free to pay for medical expenses, and any unused funds grow tax-free. So you get a 700 and change tax break, and then you can immediately turn around and distribute it to repay yourself for a medical expense you had. Now, the cool thing is, is that with the increase in the standard deduction, a lot of people, no, few people are going to be itemizing healthcare costs for deductions on their uh, income tax statement. So this means that the HSA is going to offer you an additional benefit of further reducing your taxable liability, getting into their tax write-off and still getting a tax-free distribution from that. Now, let's say you have no HSA involved. You use $3,650 out of pocket, so add your tax to pay for healthcare expenses. You would have to have $4,500 of earnings and pay 20% tax to end up with $3,650. So you get a significantly better shake if you're gonna be paying out of pocket for medical expenses to use an HDHP that qualifies for HSA coverage, then not. And again, let's say you don't have those medical expenses, you get to treat this just like a traditional IRA once you become the age of 65. So hopefully, you know, this kind of starts to sink in of just what huge benefit these can have. Now there's two different types of HSA accounts. One is an individual HSA and the other is a family HSA. So, with an individual, that means that it's just your coverage that's qualifying for the HSA. So coverage uh, is only one individual, solo healthcare plan. 
the deductible must be at least $1,400 and the self out of pocket maximum can't be greater than $6,900. A family HSA, again, covers you and dependents, uh, family coverage deductible must be at least $2,800 and the out of pocket maximum cannot be greater than $13,800. So <clears throat> with that said, it's always important to contact your healthcare provider to make sure that it is HDHP qualifying coverage because just those things are not going to necessarily mean that it is HSA qualifying. Unfortunately, with the Affordable Care Act, although the Affordable Care Act did a lot of great things, um, you know, it's I'm not here to pass judgment. There's certainly people that don't like the Affordable Care Act, but it definitely had some benefits, has some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks I'm going to focus on again, not judging this piece of legislation, but it does have some effects that are detrimental to what actually qualifies health savings accounts because there's some additional parts of your health plan that have to be in place for the HDHP to work because most people, when they hear that, they go, okay, great. Yeah, my out-of-pockets and my deductibles definitely meet that. I can have an HSA. Unfortunately, some of the legislation kind of shifted how some of the plans were sold on the marketplace. So your plan cannot have a copay for office visits. And this is the one that gets a lot of them. Other than preventative care, annual physicals, prenatal, well-child immunizations, and certain screenings, and you also cannot have a copay on prescription drugs until you meet your deductible. For 2022, the self-only coverage deductible limit is $1,400. And for 2022, the family coverage deductible must be at least $2,800. Um, you cannot have other health coverage. You can have vision, dental, or workman's comp or long-term disability, but if you have multiple healthcare coverage plans, you can't have an HSA. So unfortunately, let's say your <clears throat> spouse has a plan that covers the entire family. You can't go out to the ACA marketplace and buy an HDHP plan and cover your family or yourself if you're still covered under that other insurance. You would have to drop off that plan and then gain coverage for that. A perfect example is that of myself. My wife, we were covered under a healthcare plan that <clears throat> uh, through her job, then I decided to get on Advanta's HSA option. So I dropped off her insurance and took up the HSA coverage. Granted, you can be covered by multiple insurances, but to have the HSA plan, you have to drop any other coverage besides dental, workman's comp, vision, or long-term disability. You also cannot be enrolled in Medicare, and you cannot be claimed as someone else's dependent in order to have this type of coverage. Now, another really interesting part about these types of plans, and it's something that maybe trips people up a little bit, is that let's say you get one of these plans. Well, the problem is, is that these plans um, you have to do through open enrollment. So there's some specific inclusions for how you qualify making a contribution for a full year if you've only had coverage for one month. Um, for It's called the first day of the last month rule. So you are treated as having HSA coverage for a calendar year as long as the HDHP plan is in place by 12-1 of that year. To keep the full year's contribution in the HSA, you must maintain the HDHP plan for a full 12 months. So if you get coverage, open enrollment at the end of the year, you can make a full year contribution, even though you were only covered for one month, but you have to remain covered by that HDHP, so the, the healthcare plan, for at least a full year in order to not have to take a pro rata distribution of the contribution that you that you made under the first day of the last month rule. Now, let's say, for example, Ben enrolls in an HDHP plan 1130 of 2022. He can contribute his full individual $3,700 HSA contribution for 2022 and take and write it off on his taxes for the given year of 2022 when he files in 2023. If Ben loses the HDHP coverage prior to 11-30-2023, he must take a prorated distribution, so the number of months that he wasn't covered um, as the prorata and distribute it from the plan, and then it's going to be subjected to taxes and a 10% penalty. So it's important if you want to do this, again, making the informed decisions to get the correct type of healthcare coverage, but also maintaining the coverage. So if you just want to drop off for, let's say, one month and do this, granted, you're going to have issues with other rules regarding um, qualifying events for healthcare coverage exemptions. But you need to understand that you need to maintain this coverage as well, because the additional flexibility and benefit that it offers you is something that you're going to have to really make sure you weigh against any potential negatives for you to maintain this type of coverage, um, you know, into the future for at least a year. So contributing to HSAs, contributions must be made in cash. You can do a one-time rollover from a traditional IRA 
I just include this as completeness. You can do it from a Roth IRA to an HSA, but it's not really a good shake to do it from a Roth IRA because you're going to be losing out on the tax deduction benefit of moving in there. Really, you lose out on it from a traditional IRA as well because you only get one tax deduction, whereas you could potentially contribute to a traditional IRA, write that off, also contribute to a HSA and write that off and have the full amount of contribution limits to work with. Now, I said you can do a one-time funding rollover. However, that is going to be subjected to the contribution limits for that particular year. Contributions can be made by an employee or an employer. If it's made by your employer on your behalf, you get to keep all that money. They make it into the plan. There's no vesting schedule. It's yours. So keep that in mind, but you don't get to write off your employer's contribution, only what you put in there to the plan. Deductions can be taken even if you don't itemize your deductions and contributions can be made up until your tax filing date the following year. However, you don't get to include uh, extensions in that. So I said you can use this for reimbursement of qualified medical expenses. What are qualifying medical expenses? Well, it has to be a medical expense that was incurred, one, while the, while the HSA was in place and also while the HDHP was in effect as well. So you can pay for things like healthcare plan deductibles, cost of doctor's visits, dental care, unless it was covered by a dental plan, vision care, unless it was covered by additional vision insurance, medication, so prescriptions. If you have been prescribed OTC meds, so if your doctor prescribed you, let's say Zyrtec or Claritin or uh, Advil for inflammation, something like that, uh, you can certainly use the HSA funds to pay for things like that. Chiropractors, bandages, OT first aid kits, uh, disabled dependent care expenses, capital improvements for your home for the purposes of medical care, long-term care, psychiatric and psycho psychological care. And here's a really, really important one that I really want to hammer home to people is that if you need to travel for a medical procedure um, or something that is medically necessary, and you can get the full list of the all of the different types of um, qualifying or what are qualifying medical um, expenses and procedures, uh, you can look up uh, publication 502. If you need to travel for something like that, you can use HSA funds, again, tax deductible funds to pay for lodging and trip and uh, ex sorry, for lodging and trip expenses related to that medical care and the medical care itself, which I think is really cool. So not only can you improve your home, let's say you're disabled, let's say you need to travel for some type of medical procedure, you can use HSA funds for that as well. So all of those great tax benefits that you got going in, all of the earnings and everything can all be distributed completely tax-free to pay for these kind of things. And again, if you would like a comprehensive list, go to IRS publication 502, and it's all listed out there right there in alphabetical order for you. I'd be here for three days if I was reading it all off to you. So with that said, what are non-qualified medical expenses? Well, healthcare plan, healthcare plan premiums, except for COBRA, non-prescription drugs, weight loss programs, um, if it's for cosmetic purposes. So fortunately, can't do that. But let's say it's bariatric surgery prescribed by a doctor for weight loss, laparoscopic band, things like that, certainly. Cosmetic surgery, teeth whitening, nutritional supplements, healthcare club dues. Although <laughs> I think everyone could probably be a little bit healthier if we all uh, exercise regularly, but that's neither here nor there. You can't use an HSA for it. Um, so unfortunately, that's off the table. Uh, you also can't use it for payment of future medical expenses. So you'd have to pay out of pocket. You can immediately reimburse yourself, or you could use the funds for a point of payment. You know, let's say you go in and have to pay for it. You can use the HSA funds to pay for it right there. Uh, record keeping of expenses. If you want to utilize these funds to repay yourself at a future date, you have to record keep your expenses in order to qualify the tax free distribution. Kind of a long way of saying save your receipts. Um, you know, don't crumple them up and throw them out. Um, and then you know you can make these distributions to yourself um, as you see fit. Now, what I want to cover at the end, I'm really passionate about HSAs. I think everyone should at least be comprehensively aware of what type of plans are out there and what type of savings incentives are offered to people. And again, the flexibility as well. When you have less money that you're spending on healthcare plan premiums, because high deductible healthcare plans are going to be the cheaper option, you potentially have more money to save, i.e. more money to contribute to an HSA, making those contributions, getting tax write-offs, and then being able to invest those funds in a direction you see fit with the great tax advantage of not paying any taxes, Granted, one year, two years, 
you're not going to see the biggest benefit from this. But when you start taking these types of accounts and you invest them year over year, compounding that tax-free interest and tax-free returns in them, you can get some very significant gains, just like you would with an IRA. Because keep in mind, the contribution limits, while a little bit shorter on the individual side for an HSA compared to an IRA, you can definitely see the benefit of an IRA. And with the HSA, you get basically the best of both worlds. You get deductibility going in and tax-free going out for reimbursement or payment of medical expenses. And you get to do all that while also having the options to invest these things as you see fit. I mentioned I have a client that invests in rental real estate with HSAs, but I have clients that flip real estate contracts, do wholesaling, lend people notes, buy precious metals, all with HSA accounts. You're not just limited to dumping this at your local bank at 0% interest. And just saying, hey, you know what, I'm just going to battle inflation for the next 15 years and, and be good with it. You can actually make some serious returns with these types of an account. And again, if you get to be 65 and you don't have any medical expenses, well, then hats off to you, one, for being healthy. But two, now you get to treat it as an additional retirement income plan. So you get to distribute money just pay a little bit of tax and the money's yours to use for what you want it for. And the other good thing is that you can reimburse yourself in perpetuity for an expense. So let's say, for example, right now I have an HSA and let's say I need to go get some stitches. I cut myself in my garage and needed 10 stitches. Well, let's say the bill for that was $2,000 for everything said and done, you know, 10 stitches, <laughs> uh, you know, 200 bucks a stitch and, um, you know, we're out of there. So let's say, okay, fine. I'm going to pay for that, not take a tax deduction, but I'm going to maybe make the contribution to my HSA or leave the money in the HSA and continue to accrue earnings. Well, let's say 10 years from now, I decide, you know what? I've had a bunch of earnings. I could use $2,000 reimbursement for that. So I write a check to myself for my HSA, reimburse myself, Make sure I provide that on my uh, tax return saying, hey, this was a qualifying HSA distribution for a medical expense incurred during the time of this plan 10 years ago. Well, now I have $2,000 extra dollars. I haven't spent, you know, I've obviously spent the money, but now I get a tax redistribution to reimburse myself. But that money goes directly into my bank account, do whatever I want to with it at that point. So, but during that time, but during that time, instead of just having used after tax money, I paid for it or sorry, and pay for it with after-tax money. And then I continued to grow and accumulate and compound the interest on that $2,000 medical bill. And you know who knows exactly how much money you can make, but I can almost be assured that doing it in a tax-advantaged manner, if I can afford to pay out of pocket and then just continue to invest it, is probably going to be a much better shake than a lot of other things out there. So with that said, uh, I know this is a little bit long-winded. We've kind of covered a lot. I really hope some people get some information out of this that's useful with regard to making more informed healthcare decisions and ultimately what options are out there for you. Because if you think you have an HSA, you may not. If you'd like to learn more about this, I would encourage you to give me a call directly. You can reach me at 727-754-9954. Go to advantaira.com. Um, because the nice thing is, is that now that you understand that HSAs can be used for alternative investments, when we have these great guests on here that are talking about doing all these interesting alternative investments, don't just think that IRAs and other types of retirement accounts are really the only thing that we do or you know that there aren't other options out there for you. Really to be accurate in looking at the full scope of all, the advantage of alternative investing, you have to include HSAs in that picture. You can also include ESAs in that picture, 401ks, IRAs, Roth, traditional. All these different kinds of things need to be a comprehensive a toolbox for the alternative investor when it comes to using uh, the tax advantages that the IRS gives us. Granted, none of us enjoy paying taxes. I'm probably pretty sure that we, it's one thing 100% of uh, people listening to this can agree on, but we do have additional tools. And especially when it comes to utilizing health savings plans, uh, it's definitely something that's very interesting. And, and I really hope people got a benefit out of it. So with that said, this has been the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.